afternoon session. Um, before we start with Erica and Anamisa, uh, Mike's going to do a quick announcement. Yeah, so hey everyone. Oh, let me know. Um, oh, it is? Okay, great. Uh, I just wanted to give like a real quick shameless plug for Astrobytes, um, the blog I co-chair. Uh, we're a daily research like related blog sponsored and hosted by the American Astronomical Society, in which grad students break down like a recent archive paper yeah. to a level that's digestible by undergrads or even the general public. Um, it's about a team of 30 of us and we are having like our annual hiring <coughs> call. Um, the deadline is like nominally tomorrow, but if you're really interested in writing, talk to me and we can like extend that till after the weekend. Um, but yeah, we get about 50,000 page views per month, and it's a great outlet for grad students to practice writing, because you know we get a lot of practice as grad students doing research, but we don't get as much practice presenting the research. Um, and so it's a great outlet to do that. Also, if you're an educator, um, we're really trying to push to get Astrobytes used more in classrooms, either um, to communicate topics to students, or to get students um, writing uh, breakdowns of topics in an Astrobytes style. So we have sample lesson plans you can use if you're interested in using Astrobytes in your classroom. Um, just talk to me for any of that. Thanks. You can keep just talking. I'll just keep talking about her. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, Eric, Erica is a, uh, works mostly in observations of, um, of star forming galaxies, uh, high redshift galaxies, and is also linking uh, simulations with observations. Or, and she found her talk. So thank you, Erica. <coughs> um, well, this is considering itself. It's it's showing up on my screen, so it's up I, I think yeah, it's just the there. We go. It's only a matter of time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone. I'm Erica Nelson. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I have learned so much this week. I cannot even tell you. As galaxy people, we don't actually we talk about star formation a lot, but we don't actually have. I think so. Okay. Um, is that not loud enough? Okay. Yeah. But we don't. It's good. Great. Great. Awesome. I can also shout. You'll like that. Um, we don't actually really have any idea how it works. Like if you were to ask me how star formation happened before this week, I would probably have been like, yeah, yeah. Cool. Good talk to you later. Um, so this has been really amazing. Um, people are doing really incredible work here that really informs all of what we do at High Redshift. Um, so today I want to um, go out in scale a little bit from um, actual star formation to star formation on galactic scales. Um, specifically, um, I want to understand how the universe went from its universe, uniform st state shortly after the Big Bang to the rich diversity of galaxies that we see today. Um, how these galaxies grew, how they assembled their stellar mass, how they formed their stars. Um, 
because essentially, and how that's tied to this conference is you can kind of think of the entire structural formation history of galaxies as the integral of the spatial distribution of its star formation across cosmic time. Um, and so we're basically taking all of the star formation um, and averaging it over billions of years uh, to see how the different structures and galaxies assembled and how they how the star formation happened. Um, so just like to, I know you know you know what a galaxy is, but just to kind of like get your brain get your brain there. Um, this is a galaxy. This is Andromeda, our nearest neighbor. Um, and Andromeda, is, Andromeda, as well as our Milky Way, um, are fairly typical galaxies in the sense that an average star in the universe is most likely to live in a galaxy like this, in a galaxy with this a similar stellar mass, and a galaxy that has uh, a disk and a bulge. Um, so a disk, like a spinning pinwheel of stars and a bulge, you can imagine like bees in a beehive um, whizzing around in an ellipsoidal structure. Um, and so the question we want to understand is how do galaxies come to look as they do and have the properties they have? How did this star formation happen to get what we see today? So the problem um, is that most star formation in most galaxies happened in the very distant past. Um, and so, uh, and I'll talk today about why we can't just infer um, how this galaxy growth happened based on the star formation we see today. Um, but the, so the issue is we need to look back into the past in order to understand how these galaxies grew, which is a problem. Um, but there is a solution. There's a, several solutions, but the one I found most mind-blowing um, was one I learned about when I was in second grade, which is that you can use telescopes as time machines. So this actually is why I'm standing in front of you today. I did a report on the Hubble Space Telescope, um, and I just thought it was like the coolest thing ever. And this is my extremely relevant artistic uh, things here. Um, so we can use telescopes as time machines, essentially, um, as you all well know, um, because light takes a finite amount of time to travel from point A to point B. So if we look very far away, uh, we're essentially looking back in time. Um, so when I talk throughout this talk uh, about uh, distances and redshifts, what I'm saying is that things that are very far away have been, their light has been redshifted due to cosmic expansion. Um, and so we're looking at things at very early times. So that's all well and good and ele um, conceptually elegant. However, um, observations at high redshift are hard. Um, the galaxies, uh, are a significantly smaller angular scale in the sky. Their light is faint, um, and it's redshifted to bands that are significantly less convenient for us to observe. So for us at high redshift, this is spectacular. This is the most gorgeous high resolution image ever. This is 10 kiloparsecs. Like we're not talking about AU here. This is 10, one pixel. Um, so this is gorgeous for us, uh, but when we compare it to the observations uh, we have from people like Kara and that we've seen throughout this week, um, it's just we completely lack any of the relevant detail for resolved measurements of star formation. So you might ask, why? Why would we do this? Why would we look to uh, parts of the universe where we simply cannot get the quality of information that we have locally? Um, and so. By way of an explanation for this, and also by way, as a way to overview uh, all of the relevant discoveries in the evolution of galaxies for the past 10 years, um, I want to show you what we've learned about the evolution of galaxies from uh, Redshift 2 to today, uh, and show you that what we see is that galaxies are really very different at Redshift 2. Um, at the kind of peak of the cosmic star formation history. And so if we're going to, un so the properties of star formation then must also have been very different. Um, and how galaxies form their stars must have been very different. So it actually is essential to look back to these early cosmic times to see how this was happening. Before I do that though, I'm going to give you three slides on the methodologies, the key methodologies we use to study galaxies at early times. So it's gonna be a 
whirlwind here. Um, so essentially what we do, we have, <coughs> so galaxies are very faint and they subtend a very small angular size in the sky. So the strategy that we employ are these pencil beam surveys. So we look at a very, very small patch of the sky, uh, we skewer it and spend a lot of time to go very deep on these very small areas. As a community, we have decided that there are only five relevant patches of the sky, and they are these five extragalactic deep fields. So this, in its entirety, and this is thousands of hours on space-based telescopes, and thousands more on ground-based telescopes, on these 900 square arc minutes of sky. True fact. Um, so essentially all that we know about the high redshift of the universe comes from these 900 square arc minutes. So let's hope there's not you know, significant issues beyond that. Um, so our strategy has essentially been to hit these 900 square arc minutes with every telescope that we can get our hands on for as long as we can get our hands on them. Um, so we, uh, everything from the UV through the infrared, X-ray, radio, um, we need all of these things to better constrain galaxy pro the properties of galaxies at these early times which, you know, similar. Um, so, and we essentially fit sp stellar population models to all of the data we have um, for all the galaxies. So, the key thing though, that we need in order to translate all those fluxes, so we measure fluxes for all the little galaxies that we have in these fields, um, and the key thing in order to interpret these fluxes as uh, actual properties, physical properties of the galaxies, is we need to know their distances, we need to know the redshifts. Um, and so the, this project I was part of, um, the 3 dhst project, um, measured uh, a bunch of spectroscopic, it's really grism spectroscopic, so they're kind of in between photometric redshifts and spectroscopic redshifts, i.e. bad redshifts and good redshifts. So they're like medium okay redshifts. Um, but we did this for a really large sample of galaxies um, for about 100,000 galaxies at these early cosmic times um, and produced these public catalogs which contain kind of the key properties of galaxies, masses, star formation rates, um, redshifts, sizes, um, the kind of very, very most basic properties of galaxies. And this was a huge amount of effort, but this, um, these kind of catalogs kind of have formed the basis for the last several years um, of our follow-up efforts to understand galaxy kinematics and metallicities and the more complex properties of galaxies. So, uh, by way of some context here, so um, this is the cosmic star formation history. So if you take all of the star formation in the entire universe and you add it up and divide it by the volume, um, this is what you get. So it increases from the Big Bang up to about redshift 2, and then it decreases from redshift 2 to today. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about the era from redshift 2 to the beginning of the universe because we essentially don't know anything. Um, what I am going to talk about is, which is kind of, we've really learned a lot in the last, um, in the last several years, is thank you to the Hubble Space Telescope, is about uh, this epoch from about redshift one to three, and compare that to the local universe. So um, going, this is all of the significant, well, that's, I shouldn't say that, that's not fair. These are some of the significant developments in observational astrophysics in extragalactic for the last 10 years in a schematic. So um, going from redshift two to zero, so from um, the kind of peak of the cosmic star formation history when star formation rates are high, were highest uh, down to today. We know that we've found that the star formation rate of individual galaxies normalized by the mass that they've already developed uh, decreases dramatically from redshift two to, to today. Um, the molecular, molecular gas fractions also decline significantly. Um, they drop from about 50% to about 5% over that time. Um, this is what Annalisa will talk about. Um, I don't know why I didn't put, anyways. This is, Anna, this is what Annalisa is talking about. That's true. That's why I, didn't, I knew there was a reason. Um, so uh, this is what Annalisa is going to talk about, so I won't mention that. Um, basically, like, the velocity dispersions of galaxy disks decline. 
Um, and so what all these top three things are saying are basically we're going from a time where galaxies are rapidly accreting gas and forming stars, and they have these chaotic, turbulent disks. Um, and these galaxies are settling down through cosmic time to today and, and forming um, the structures that we see today. It's been termed the epoch of disk settling. Who knows? Um, you all have things to say about that. <laughs> you probably don't like that. Um, OK. Uh, the final two things, which have to do with the structure of galaxies, um, they get bigger. They go from little to big. Um, this is all average. Um, and they go from disk dominated, so flat little pancakes, um, and increasingly become sphere dominated um, at uh, modern times. So galaxies have dramatically different properties um, when we go, sorry, I'm going to get some water, um, have dramatically different properties when we go from um, early cosmic times to today. So it is important to understand how the star formation happened at these early times. Um, and, but this is hard. So you guys will all be familiar. I'm going to show you a movie. This is Orion. Is it going to go? It always freaks. Oh, there it goes. Um, so we want to measure star formation, right? Um, so what we do, so this is a zoom in on the Orion Nebula which is a star forming region, which you all know a lot more about than I do. The thing I do know uh, is that this um, you have a lot of hot, young stars producing a lot of uh, hot, high energy emission, which ionizes <coughs> the surrounding hydrogen. Um, and as it recombines, uh, you see this red Balmer alpha emission. And for the purposes of the high redshift universe, um, we take that we use uh, scaling relations and we translate that into a star formation rate. We can't count young stellar objects, we can't ca count clouds, we can't count cores. So we just take the flux we observe of H alpha and we scale it to a star formation rate. Crude, but that's what we do. So um, in the local universe, we've long had beautiful images of H alpha. We can see the rich structure of galaxies as traced by um, their H alpha emission. Uh, at high redshifts, this is, until recently, this is what we had. This is, this is not beautiful. Uh, this is not resolved. So it's hard to tell anything about the structure of uh, galaxies based on this. Uh, so there was a huge development, and Sandra Tekela has worked a lot on this, um, when with uh, adaptive optics with integral field units on 10 meter class telescopes. Uh, with these, for the first time, we could really resolve kind of the one kiloparsec spatial scales that are necessary to um, map star formation in these early galaxies and understand the formation of galactic structure. The problem with this is uh, these observations are incredibly, incredibly expensive. Um, so to map one galaxy at kiloparsec spatial resolution, to me that sounds great, to you that sounds terrible, um, is, takes an entire night on a 10 meter class telescope. That is a really long time and that is really hard to get approved by attack. Um, you essentially have to have built the instrument in order to get a sizable sample. Um, so, the, so we essentially up until I think 23 as of 2013, had about 60 galaxies at which we had mapped H alpha um, at this kind of spatial resolution that we need uh, to study star formation. So um, they installed the Wide Field Camera 3 on the Hubble Space Telescope, and the Wide Field Camera 3 had uh, this thing called a grism on it, a grating prism. And I'm not going to go into the gory details. I'm happy to talk about them, um, but I developed a method that used the GRISM to allow us to map uh, star formation in, or map H alpha emission, um, in a significantly larger population of uh, these early galaxies um, for a lot cheaper. So 
To me, this is beautiful. These are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful H alpha maps of galaxies. Um, that's what you should take away from this. Um, so basically, uh, with this new method, we got, went from six, about 60 galaxies with resolved measurements of H alpha emission uh, to 3,200. Um, and so one of the things we can do with this, um, this is probably the most basic thing I can tell you right now, um, is we can see where the average star formed at these early epochs. And if we average over all of the galaxies and all of the star formation, we find that the average new star was formed at about 1.5 kiloparsecs from the galaxy center. Um, I'm not going to tell you about any more about the results or what we use this for. Um, oh, that's not true. We use it for a bunch of stuff um, to understand how galaxies grow in size, how they build their structures, um, how they drive galactic winds, um, how the properties of star formation change in galaxy clusters. And then after Annalisa talks about things, about theory, um, I'm going to get back to talking about how galaxies regulate their star formation as an example of how we can link observations and simulations. Okay, so now Annalisa is going to talk about simulations because I'm supposed to talk about observations and simulations, and I was going to talk about her simulation, and it just didn't seem right. So she is talking about her simulation. Thanks, Okay, she. Oops. Um, there we go. Um, so, yes, Erika has just told you that, first of all, in terms of galaxy evolution, Cosmic epochs are not self-similar, and by this I really mean the galaxies of the same nominal galaxy stellar mass are very different between Rashi 0 and Rashi 2. And at the same time, even at fixed mass, at the fixed cosmic epoch, galaxy can be very diverse. And so then when we try to understand the plethora of uh, information coming from observations, um, and especially when thinking about a large survey with many, many galaxies, we would like to contrast them to models, and these models require um, to be as possible as self consistent above a certain spatial scale, let's put it like that. And they need to account for the cosmological context, and possibly they should be capable of modeling at once many, many galaxies for this comparison across populations. And so, just to set the stage and make him some, put some order in what we heard so far, uh, so historically, the galaxy simulations have gone through two separate tracks. On the one hand, people have uh, made, uh, since decades, a simulation of isolated galaxies. They could have been stars only or gas only. We have heard fantastic simulations this morning from Vadim on these lines. On the other hand, since a couple of decades, people have actually started to do large cosmological simulations where the only, the only ingredient that is solved is gravity. And so in practice, fantastic thousands, tens of megaparsecs, but no galaxies. Um, in the meantime, things have gone very well. So the, we have done quite some progress. And this is also due to the fact that we have progressively improved both sides. Uh, on the individual galaxy side, we have put this isolated galaxy also in the cosmological context, which simply means you simulate one of those gigantic dark matter simulations, you choose one halo, you zoom, and then you solve for more physics than just gravity. Uh, these are examples like Fire, uh, Riga, Nihau, the Torsten Ab simulations. And on the other side, these dark matter only simulations have become really good, really accurate with uh, trillions of particles. Uh, however, uh, since just a few years, we have managed to bridge uh, these two approaches with these uh, tens of megaparsec hydrodynamical simulations where we also managed to simulate thousands of galaxies down to the level of the kiloparsec scale. And really, I just want to um, think about it a moment, because sometimes we are very harsh with this type of simulation, but they are really young, yes? So uh, the illustrious simulation, which was developed be here by my colleague Mark Fokusberger and, and the Lars Anquist team, was really one of the first simulations on these large scales capable of following the evolution of thousands of galaxies and to reproduce the diversity of galaxies as observed. And this is just a large-scale structure image of the movie, of a movie from a portion of Illustris in various elements. So oh, don't worry, it's fine. I actually have to go further with the movie. So. And in the very last years, we have actually even shortened the distance between these two channels of making uh, simulations with the Illustris TNG uh, galaxy simulation models, where we are really bridging the gap 
between zoom in and large scale simulations. So for those of you who are not familiar, maybe you just can imagine that if you want to evaluate where the current simulations stand, you can put them on a plot like this, where this is baryonic mass resolution, say the stellar particle mass or the gas cell mass, and on this size is the number of galaxies which are resolved above a certain mass. More massive galaxies are difficult to make because at fixed resolution they require you more resolution elements. So these are the, where the zoom galaxies are, the ones we mentioned before, where people are actually now simulating galaxies with stellar particle of uh, 10,000 or 1,000 solar masses. And on this other side, there are these box regimes, illustrious eagle, or rise and AGN, and the TNG simulations. And more recently, we are pushing towards this corner, which is incredibly expensive, with, for example, this TNG 50 simulation. And so now, just let me tell you what we are doing in this kind of simulations. Uh, to, to Again, it's, it's, it's more informative here. So we are starting from a distribution of material which is consistent with cosmological initial conditions, and then we literally solve for the equation of hydrodynamics, Euler equations, so ideal Euler equations, and, um, and gravity. And then we need a series of rules or prescriptions or physical laws to uh, allow the gas to cool or be heated, convert <laughs> gas into stars. We have some model for the interstellar medium. Um, we allow for the stellar particles to evolve a stellar population. We allow them to produce metals, to return this metal to the interstellar medium that will do next generation of stars. And we include this feedback from stars and supermassive black holes. But this is super general. I would need 10 hours to just tell you what, how we do in the simulations I do. But the important thing is that, unfortunately, as you can imagine, all these are subgrid in the kind of simulations that I mentioned before, the box regimes, where the spatial scales are a kiloparsec or many hundreds of parsec. And on the other hand, so we have to Im Im implement them on the subgrid manner. And on the other hand, there are other uh, mechanisms that we place in by via lookup tables that we, uh, you know, um, put together by taking information from the literature, say on stellar evolution or, or possible ways of having uh, metal line cooling, etc. But one thing that I want you to remember is that the fact that we solve for the, at least these equations in, a, in an expanding universe, it means that there are many events, phenomena, that are done self-consistently differently than, say, in semi-analytical models, like the accretion of gas from the large-scale structure into halos, galaxy mergers, galaxy interaction, dynamical friction, run pressure stripping, and so on and so forth. Still, you may wonder, how do we then decide on how to implement this? When we, this is a lot of words, maybe just listen to me. Um, so maybe I give you just the idea, which is behind uh, this kind of exercises we do in the, in the experiments of Elastris or Eagle or TNG. So in practice, we are after effective theory for galaxy formation. Nobody is thinking that it's solving self formation. Unfortunately, definitely not, or the interstellar medium. But, but they really want models that function above a certain physical scale across the widest possible range of massive environment and recifes. And then we want not just to form galaxy, but we want to uh, take into account the cosmological context and everything that this implies. And once we get the average galaxy population consistent with the observations, we want to use this simulation to, as laboratories to understand, for example, why some galaxies come out disk and some other come out elliptical at the same mass at the same time. Um, to do that, we use some observational constraint to choose our models. But then everything else, okay, we consider it a prediction, more or less direct, of the model, or, or as I said, uh, we consider them a gift of the simulation. And then we take this gift of the simulation and we co keep contrasting them to many other observational statements from individual galaxies or populations of galaxies. And this ultimately will help us to validate or not o entire or aspects of the models. Everything I said applies to these kind of models like Elastris, Eagle, or TNG, but with different uh, <laughs> exceptions, for example. So now, of course, we would love to do these kind of simulations. Uh, <laughs> Romana, but <laughs> yes, but I am told here that to do this kind of simulation, maybe you want to describe it, it takes oh, one million hours, CPU hours just to do that. And so then if you <laughs> want to do it for an entire galaxy and for thousands or millions of galaxies, then it, yeah, you don't, yeah, you don't finish. Yeah. And so then this is why we do. That's so there your calculation. <laughs> yeah. 
And so this is clear that there are many aspects in our model, as I mentioned, that are subgrid. Subformation will be subgrid forever in, now, in this kind of models, I would think. Um, exactly because so in cosmological simulations on volumes, we can at best get 50 or 100 parsec of, of uh, spatial resolution. So we definitely don't resolve everything <coughs> you guys really care about. However, we can always make star formation by converting gas into stars. These can be star particles or can be sinks. And Vadim already told you everything about this. And the majority of our models are based on a, a density threshold above which gas above this threshold is transforming into stars. However, different models may take different values of these density thresholds, or they may also include other properties of the gas. Maybe the density threshold is associated to a proper, um, some um, properties of the metallicities, or it's applied to only to molecular gas, or you require the gas to be self-gravitating with convergent flows, etc. cetera. Uh, in the typical simulations I'm talking about, we make stars, and these are star particles, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 6 solar masses that represent entire Mono-age stellar populations with a given IMF, we take one forever and everywhere, say Chabrier, and then we allow the stellar population to evolve. Um, and of course, okay, these translations of gas into stars also require the definition of certain time scale for star formation, and in certain models, for example, we choose the parameters to reproduce, say, a Kanika-Schmidt relation between sigma SFR and sigma total gas, say, with a slope of 1.5. Um, all right, and then maybe another notion of caution is that our interstellar model is really crude. This is true in last year, this is true in Eagle, this is true in TNG. So this is temperature and density, and you guys really care about here. And we have a lot of gas in the intergalactic medium, in the circumgalactic medium, and in the interstellar medium, actually, because we don't do radiation tr transfer on, on, the, on the scale we care, we don't do really supernova feedback on, on the small scales. In order to avoid artificial fragmentation of the gas, we actually impose the gas to lie on an equational state, or rather model assume a certain pressure floor. This, of course, uh, uh, doesn't allow us to study aspects of the interstellar medium on smaller scales than 100 parsecs or so. But allows us to do very nice things because um, the galaxies look still really nice. And uh, I just show them here. So, for example, these are galaxies on simulation at kiloparsec scale, and I'm done soon. And uh, these are galaxies which are selected to be red on G minus R colors. And these are the galaxies that are selected to be blue in G minus R color, where you immediately see that the underlying model actually gives, as a gift, a separation also in morphology associated to the different star formation activity as encoded in the colors. OK, and I pass it back. OK, awesome. Thank you. Oops. OK, thank you, Annalisa. I would not have gotten like a quarter of that information across had it been me talking. Um, okay, great. So, uh, here we go. Hmm? Okay, so, um, yeah, here we are. Um, okay, so Annalisa just guest starred, told us about the key kind of advances in um, simulations. And so I just wanted to very quickly, I think I'm going to just very quick skim through this because we're running a little late, um, talk about an example of how we can, um, of linking observations and theory uh, to understand how galaxies um, regulate their star formation on kind of a galaxy-wide scale. So the uh, context in which we can put this is there is um, this plane, this derivative integral plane, the derivative star formation rate versus the integral stellar mass um, on which we can place galaxies. If we place our observed galaxies in this plane, um, we can see that there is a locus of points. Um, so this total star formation rate a galaxy is forming at is proportional to the stellar mass that it's already assembled. But um, not all galaxies live um, on this relation at all times. 
They might grow um, faster at times or more slowly at times um, over the course of their assembly histories. This is uh, from the TNG simulation. Uh, we can't do this. We can't make movies like this of observations. We cannot track galaxies over 10 billion years of cosmic time to see how they um, evolve in star formation and mass throughout their assembly histories. We just do not have um, the accuracy with star formation histories to enable us to do this. So this is really something that we can only do with simulations at present, maybe in the future with observations. So um, the question a lot of us have been trying to answer recently um, is what drives the star formation to be enhanced or suppressed in galaxies? Why um, do galaxies live above the main sequence and below the main sequence? What is driving, um, what is driving this increase and decrease? What regulates star formation? So kind of the classic theoretical picture here is you have normal star forming galaxies, um, which are on the main sequence. Star formation is happening in their disks. Uh, and then you take them and you <coughs> smash them together in a merger that drives gas to the center of uh, the galaxy, resulting in a starburst. This starburst builds the bulge. Um, that starburst, oh, thanks. Um, that starburst, uh, depletes the central gas reservoir, perhaps in conjunction with an active galactic nucleus, and you see um, the star formation, which is centrally <laughs> depleted. Um, so this merger uh, thing is kind of the classic picture. Uh, Sandra Tekela came up with a model um, using uh, hydrodynamical zooms, uh, where in addition to mergers driving gas to the center of galaxies, you can really, because of the properties of these early galaxies, these very gas-rich disks, you can have uh, torques which drive gas into the center as a consequence of clumps or some kind of other disturbance um, of the disk. And so then you have this episode where all the gas is driven to the center, causing a burst of star formation, um, and then uh, this depletion with uh, and the galaxy falling below the main sequence. And you can see um, the galaxy going kind of above and below the main sequence, like you saw in that movie earlier, as a consequence of these episodes of um, compaction and depletion. Um, so this was this model Sandro published in 2016. And um, at the same time as Sandro was um, working on this model, both of us actually were working on um, observations of uh, the star formation in galaxies above and below the main sequence. Um, and uh, I should say, at that, <laughs> at that point, Sandra and I were like arch rivals. Um, and now he's uh, my very good friend and a, probably my closest collaborator. Um, but at that point, <laughs> it wasn't so much. Um, but everything evolves. Um, and so the prediction from a simulation like Sandro's um, is essentially that when you have a galaxy that is on the main sequence, um, or if you look at a galaxy that is above the main sequence, um, the star formation or the H alpha emission should be primarily enhanced in the center. Um, and when you look at a galaxy below the main sequence, its star formation should be primarily depressed in the center. Um, so these processes are really kind of acting in the center of galaxies to regulate star formation. Um, so Sandro, this is from... San Sorry, Sandra, this, I actually was looking for a different plot. I made Sandra send me a plot like 10 minutes ago. This is the, this is the one I was looking for. Um, so both Sandra and I found evidence um, that this does, this process does in fact happen in high mass galaxies. Um, and it's debatable what high mass is, but anyways. <coughs> um, so basically you see, um, this shows the specific star formation rate in the inside, um, in the center of galaxies versus the outside um, and distance from the main sequence. So you can see that when a galaxy is below the main sequence, it has less proportional star formation in the center. Um, and when it goes above the main sequence, it has higher um, proportional uh, star formation in the center. Um, and I see the same things in my observations, um, although Sandro did a dust correction, so his like look a lot better than mine do. Um, but that's not the only thing. In these lower mass galaxies, and actually in the higher mass galaxies as well, um, we do see uh, star formation which is enhanced and suppressed throughout the disk. Um, so in addition to um, the star formation being primarily enhanced and suppressed in the centers of galaxies in these high mass galaxies, um, providing evidence for this kind of, um, this, uh, you know, gas moving to the center, starburst, depletion. Um, we also have star formation which is enhanced and suppressed 
throughout the disc. So what this is telling us, I think, um, and this is, we're going to look at this in TNG, where Sandra and I are both looking at are looking at this together in TNG as we speak, um, is I think what this suggests is that star formation um, is regulated less by mergers um, and more by a balance between um, accretion and feedback, processes that are able to act at all radii. So, just quick cruise to do that. Um, and so on to what comes next very briefly, and then I'll put up some topics for discussion. So, on the observational side, um, as far as what comes next, the thing I am most excited about is James Webb. When that guy launches, it's going to be great. Um, the uh, sensitivity of James Webb is going to be revolutionary, um, which is in essential for um, studies of early galaxies, and in particular star formation in early galaxies. Um, there's, in particular, this region of parameter space, um, which is crucial for getting, um, for getting passion alpha um, and uh, a lot of other indicators um, of uh, stellar populations in galaxies. We will have just orders of magnitude um, better sensitivity with James Webb. Um, additionally, the spatial resolution is going to blow us out of the water. This is what we have now. This is what we'll have with James Webb. Um, so it's really the, we'll really be able to see where stars are forming, how these early galaxies are forming for the first time with James Webb, and it's going to be amazing. Um, as far as simulations, correct me if I say something wrong, um, what's kinda, what comes next, hopefully, is a more realistic treatment of the interstellar medium, um, better prescriptions for star formation, um, and ideally, although it takes a long time, I'm told, um, is radiative transfer on the fly as part of these cosmological simulations. Um, so, points for discussion. Uh, I'll just leave these up, and then we can perhaps discuss them. Great, I'm done. Okay, we will very rapidly discuss them in the next five minutes. Or you can ask questions or whatever. Uh, any questions? Well, a question for Annalise about the simulations. What did you learn in the, in the TNG 500 that you didn't learn in the TNG 50? What are that factor of a thousand in volume by you? Oh, sorry, sorry. So there are, uh, so there were 50, 100, and 300. Yeah. And so in the 300 megaparsec volume, the big one, you care about the big one? So well, e either. T tell us more about so why. I have a talk about the kinematics okay. of the kinematics, and we can only do the in 50, which is a smaller volume, but a much better resolution. At the same time, uh, in TNG 50, for example, we have only one of the September 14, so a mass, in, so hosting like M87 like galaxy. When in a TNG 300, we have hundreds of them. Uh, suppose you ran the TNG 50 a hundred times. Would that be qualitatively different? What is the... Yes, why should we do that? How do the... How do the... How do the... How do so, the, the, the filaments so, feed in? And yes. Uh, so, um, indeed, so they, they, they suck. So if you are thinking about the 10 to 15 or 10 to 14 so mass galaxy cluster, uh, Castro Galaxy, indeed it has a sphere of influence of many tens of megaparsec, this would have been caught in TNG 50, however only for one galaxy, for one cluster. I could have run many TNG 50, but not at the resolution of TNG 50, because this took two years on supercomputers to run. And so then, in TNG 300, we had to reduce the resolution considerably. Yeah, what's um, the, how many CPUs is TNG 50? Yeah, 140 million. 140 million. So I think that's <laughs> another question with that, <laughs> and related to what Eric was saying, if, including yeah. radiator transfer, how, how much would that increase the computation time? It depends very much on the implementation of the transfer, but much on the code. Mm -hmm. And I'll report Rahul Kamen, yeah. the person here, has uh, implemented an MRI technique for radiative transfer. And as far as I've heard, he does slow down by two. But then, Only a factor two? Yeah. That's but, not too bad. But, then it, but still, at the same mm -hmm. time, we cannot do this yeah. simulation again on the radiative transfer. Yeah. But a factor two is not bad. Annalisa. So I have a question uh, that actually might connect your talk, uh, your part of the talk to us, the small scale ISM people. Mm -hmm. So um, the equation of state that you assume, uh, uh, and that actually what shapes 
how the ISL uh, looks like. Do you, can you tell us something on how, how the results, how the galaxies that we, we get in the simulation depend on this assumption? Because, for example, at low metallicity, this equation of state might change uh, because of the low cooling times. Yes, so we do not uh, allow it for change. We always take the same relation between temperature and density. And this is like a, it's, it's, a, it's an effective model of the interstellar medium that for particular Argus came out in 2003. And uh, we have played in changing same with the shape, the slope uh, the, of the equation of state, and this will change the, yeah, the, the, the density structure of the interstellar medium. Uh, 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 however, admittedly on scales that we would never consider predictive, so we can even look at them. You yeah, know, but for yeah. example, when I think about launching winds or like yes. things that happen also on yes. larger scale, they also might depend, as yes. we heard earlier from mm -hmm. Dietrich, yes. on how the ISM uh, is structured. So, for example, you are right, and so then the question is how we would launch them, and then in fact it's even crude the way we launch uh, in, uh, feedback from the stars. In the sense that in, in, in the last season, in G, we adopt a non local way where we literally take gas, which should become a star forming, and we move it away by transforming it in wind particles, which are temporarily decoupled from the hydrodynamics, and then they re reattach to the hydrodynamics at slightly lower densities. And so then, yes, however, with a different equation of space. Effectively, is that generally we would have chosen slightly different choices and not to implement this fellow yeah. mm -hmm. um, Early on, you said that the average star was born at sort of 1.7 kiloparsecs from the galactic center. Do you yeah. see that evolve through time? And what feeds into that? Is it mostly quenching in the galactic center? Um, I We haven't actually been able to do that measurement at as a function of redshift. Um, it would, but it's high on my list. It's just a ton of work. <laughs> um, yeah, because you basically, you have to, um, we don't have the same indicators. We don't have the same, like, available to us at all redshifts. Um, so it's, it's going to be a tough measurement. But you would expect it to be um, more closely tied um, to the angular momentum distribution of the halos than like the stellar the stellar mass, for instance. Um, and you know, based on what you end up with the stellar mass, you would you would expect it to increase in size, but we haven't measured it yet. So cool. Uh, so last question from Simon. Yeah, so I have a follow up question on the same results. Um, so as I understand it that's based on the the H L yeah. Yeah. I, are you worried that maybe you're just missing star formation in the centers of these things because it's too extinct, even at H alpha? Yeah, I mean, so that's that result is um, is dominated by low mass galaxies, which have less extinction, so it's less of a concern. But yeah, that would be, um, I you know, and we can do. I have done Balmer decrement corrections, but as we are. We found out those are far from perfect. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the ideal solution would be to get a dust continuum of a sizable sample with Alma. Um, but it's hard. It's hard. It's reasonably easy for these high mass galaxies to do it, especially at kind of redshift two. Redshift of two. But as you go down in redshift, and as you go down in mass, it gets a lot harder. But I think that's probably where we need to go. But. Where did you end up? Do that, Kiki? Oh, that's your students. Great, thank you, Erica. Um, our next speaker is Alyssa uh, Pulisic. Uh, she's at Heidelberg, uh, and she's going to talk to us in more detail, in more detail about T and G fifty. Um, about star-forming galaxies and their gas velocity dispersions. Okay. Thank you very much. So now that you have heard a bit of this about what's behind the simulation, I want to talk about some results uh, from the simulation. And I'm going to talk about uh, the physical mechanisms which are responsible to set the normalization and the recessive trends of the velocity dispersion of the gas, of the star-forming gas. I'm going to do it with TNG50, uh, with the simulation that on a 50 megaparsec volume at 
100 parsec resolution. And a piece of this simulation can already be seen here. This is actually a few moving megaparsec, and the colors tell you uh, the mass weight 3D velocity of the gas. Uh, where you can see the formation of massive galaxies and, uh, and, um, or a smaller one. And I showed this for two reasons. One's because I thought it connected very nicely to our quest yesterday of tracing mass flows, albeit on very, very different scales. And the other reason is to keep in mind that whatever happens to galaxies, and I would argue both on galactic scales and probably smaller scales, is depending on the flows of gas in and around galaxies. And uh, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with seeing the 3D velocity, now the movie is transitioning on the stellar mass distribution. And what you are seeing is the formation of a 10 to the 14 uh, uh, Virgo-like cluster with a galaxy like M87 at the center. However, while I was talking about, I didn't manage to show you two aspects. So this, for example, is the formation of a massive galaxy, but there is even here another one. And you can see these flows of material. These are supernova feedback. And these other ones are possibly what we think are the effects on larger scale of AGN feedback, so outflows from supermassive black holes. And just to show you the complexity of the gas motions around galaxies on kiloparsec and tens of kiloparsec scales. All right, so my talk is a talk of connection, I want to go from the small scales of the week to say 100 parsec and above. Uh, we talked about the effects of galactic dynamics on star formation. I now want you to think about the effects of extragalactic and cosmological large scale structure on galactic dynamics. And uh, we talked about Milky Way and low redshift galaxy. And now we want to talk about galaxies across masses and cosmic epochs. And we connect simulations to Yes, observation, but also and some interpretation through analytical modeling. I'm going to talk about one only observable of galaxies, which is galaxy-wide or spatially resolved measurements of gas chaotic motions. Because to me, whatever we measure in terms of gas velocity dispersion is not just turbulence, but it's generally mo chaotic motions. And when I talk about inter in extragalactic astronomy, spatially resolved still means above many hundreds of parsec, if not kiloparsec levels, specially resolved. The starting point is a plot of this type, velocity dispersion of ionized or molecular gas as a function of ratio for average galaxies of 10 to the 10.5 solar masses, where people have seen observationally through long slit or IFU data that the velocity dispersion really drops uh, if you come to lower ratio that fix galaxies solar mass, with this idea that Lower redshift galaxies are characterized by lower turbulence random velocity support than higher redshift galaxies. I'm talking about sigma because this is really being used as a proxy for the physical state of the interstellar medium. However, it's quite a complex jump. Anyway, the, this plot has been interpreted like this. The idea that actually people have seen redshift two or three galaxies, they show this like structure in their gas. However, this gas is much more chaotic and velocity dispersion dominated and low gas, low, low redshift galaxies. And this has been associated to the fact that high redshift galaxies are more star forming, have higher specific star formation rates, and also higher, higher gas fractions. And we wanted to see what the simulation can tell us about all this. But in fact, when we think about galaxy shapes or kinematics, we know they are the result of many things. In fact, I would say chaotic motions in the galaxies depend on many things. Star formation, small scale turbulence, thermal heating, everything we have talked about, but I want us to think about accretion of cosmic gas into galaxies, mergers with gas rich or gas poor galaxies, interactions without necessarily merging with other galaxies, feedback and outflow from stars, feedback and outflow from supermassive black holes, and possibly the chaos produced by gas recycling falling back into a galaxy. So from our models, we know that all these are intertwined. They are different for different galaxies, different masses, and different redshift, but a priori we need to consider them all if we want to understand how sigma evolves with time. So this is what we are doing with simulation like TNG. Uh, I just talked about a moment about the GAN TNG 50. It's the last installment of this um, project where we follow the coevolution of dark matter, cosmic gas, stars, supermassive black holes, and magnetic fields in the framework of the movie mesh code repo. 
Uh, this is the work of many people. I would like to highlight uh, Volker Springle, who's the PI of all the project, Dylan Nelson at MPA, who's the co-PI of the team G50, and Lars Enquist, who's the person who brought me to this business. Um, and of course, we do something I didn't mention before. We do all these uh, different resolution for different volumes. So the team G50 is the best is the is the best resolution we have, okay, in this series. Uh, and I, in fact, we call it a cosmological volume at zoom resolution for this idea that is almost going to the typical resolution of zoom simulations. Uh, what I mean by this, these are four random galaxies, and this is uh, the colors tell you the average cell size in the Arepa code in these galaxies along the line of sight, where in blue is tens of parsec and in red is kiloparsec. But what I want you to notice is that there where we need it in the star forming region of galaxies, we have of the order of 70, 140 parsec cell sizes. So this means that we can resolve, say, the thickness of typically observed disk. We are definitely above uh, the giant molecular cloud scales, but the subgrid nature of star formation, star feedback, is subgrid below these scales, and we can also see internal kinematics and structure at this kind of scales, 100 parsec or so. So we can see them in a galaxy like that. This is gas density. This is a mock observation as if you were seeing this galaxy in three filters on near can with JWST. We can do it for a very nice, perfect spiral galaxies or messy one, like this one. But not just for two galaxies, maybe for eight galaxies, 60 galaxies. Galaxies. Huh? So this is the idea of TNG50, that we have an unbiased statistical representation of the galaxy population. And this costs a lot. We mentioned it, so I'll skip it. It requires really, literally, one year on 16,000 cores 24-7. All right, so what do we learn from TNG50 in terms of velocity dispersion? From now on, I'm just focusing on the gas which is making stars and those star-forming galaxies. So galaxies on the star-forming main sequence. SFR versus galaxy star masses, a different ratio. If I just look at them, of the ones on the, on the star forming main sequence, they could look like this. If we were painting them based on the uh, surface density of SFR. Or like this, in again, like composite, or in age alpha, where we actually do the opposite. We have SFR, but we like to plot age alpha. <laughs> age alpha light, but just assuming that can occur 98 conversion. Um, and this is what I mean by my, my measurements are all based on age alpha emitting gas. Uh, when I look at the galaxy, I can put it edge on and I can get a fantastic rotation curve, but I want velocity dispersion. So I put it face on in order to remove contribution from order motion. And this is the age alpha maps. And this is the sigma maps, average, say, on a few hundred parsec. So the velocity dispersion that I'm talking about is the second order moment of the line of sight velocity of my gas cells, but average on pixels, which are similar to what people do in observations, say 500 parsec, a kiloparsec, three kiloparsecs. And then, of course, it all depends where I measure them. I measure them where the velocity picks or asymptotes. So that then is the, is the, is, is the value where it, it bottoms down. We can do it for one galaxy or many galaxies. Again, age alpha maps or sigma, line of sight, vertical velocity dispersion of the, of the galaxies. And if, if you're interested in seeing more, just go on the website. We just decided to put thousands of galaxies, images from all our papers there. If we put all this together and we plot the average velocity dispersion of a alpha emitting gas as a function of redshift, as a function of galaxy stellar mass, in orange are the results of TNG50, and in gray are the results I mentioned at the beginning. So as a gift out of the simulation, we get naturally a de decrease in velocity dispersion, so that higher, gal higher redshift galaxies are dominated by more chaotic motion than lower redshift galaxies. So this is really a non-trivial confirmation of the functioning of the model, despite the terrible simplifications I, I told you about, and also required many galaxies in order to make this comparison. However, let's not get too much over ourselves, because uh, we can talk about the redshift trend and the normalization, but the normalization is uncertain at the level of factor of two or three, depending on how you measure this sigma, both on the simulation side or on the observational side. So first of all, this is a map, and we want one number for one galaxy. And then we can decide whether we average on, say, 500 parsec or 3 kiloparsec, whether we do mass weighted, the luminosity weighted, and all this is uncertain at the level of structure factor 2 or 3. 
Certain observations are all based on line width estimates, where people are actually removing or not the contribution from thermal motions. And this is another example of how including or not the thermal component can uh, mess up uh, your trend. Not very much, but a factor maybe again of two between the, the redshift of interest. Also, it's actually a bit sad because these maps are incredibly rich. Okay, I don't have to convince you guys that we are mistreating galaxies by just looking at one galaxy for one property per galaxy, but um, we should probably find ways to use these maps a bit better. And finally, the way you measure this, and I'm talking about this connection between observation and simulations, actually tells you <laughs> what you're looking at. For example, depending on how you measure a velocity dispersion, you can be contaminated or not by order motion. You can con consider or not the thermal motions, effects of small scale turbulence, or according to how much you are integrated along the sinus side, you can have extra planar, off planar motions or not. And all of this can be caused by self gravity, feedback from stars, from black holes, galaxy mergers, etc. So, all these uncertainties on how we compare hampers our way to compare to observation, but also the theoretical interpretation. I would like to spend a, a moment just to say about one aspect about how we would like to uh, go further. Um, because people have um, uh, interpreted this decline of sigma a fixed galaxies stellar mass by putting them in the context that galaxies at lower redshift have smaller gas fraction, but yet they can still be described in the context of marginally stable disk with certain tumor parameters, say, of equal one. And so people have described the observation by writing down sigma of the gas as a product of the gas fraction, the rotation velocity, and as a thermal parameter. Don't even get me started on how crude this model is, but I wanted to try to see whether this is the right interpretation or path of the complex results that come out from the complex simulation. Because I can measure everything, say, but for crit, I can measure a V-rot and, and the gas fraction. So in the simulations, as expected, the fraction of gas mass fraction as a function of redshift goes down as time goes by, but differently so if I look at the whole gas or the star forming gas, or if I look at the gas, say, uh, within a certain aperture or another aperture. And so then I try to plug this analytical thinking to try to see whether it reproduces my model, my simulated model. These are the, the orange one are the result from the observation, the dots, and then I try different ways to implement this interpretation. And what I really could come out with is that uncertainties in the physical meaning of the measures, in the physical meaning of the conceptual quantities, the conceptual elimination of the analytical model, all make very difficult to decide on the, what are we learning here. And for example, are we just learning that galaxies are probably more stable than assumed here? Or aren't we maybe learning that these equilibrium models are definitely not enough? because there may be large-scale effects that change with time, change with galaxy mass, that also affect directly the kinematics of gas beyond these equilibrium dynamics. And I opt for this, this one. And this is very much uh, suggested by what we see in the simulations. This is the evolution of a galaxy through cosmic time. You can just look at the main panel. This is gas density in projection or zoomed in here, where you can see a high redshift, okay? There's Gas inflows into galaxies are very important. There's a lot of mass flows coming in. And then at some point, the galaxy will, will set down in a disk-like configuration, yet characterized by outflows more or less important according to whether the black hole is acting or not. And therefore, all this is just suggesting us that Yes, galaxies can be described between redshift two and three and today as more or less stable disks, but definitely their kinematics is more complex. And this de decline, and I'll be fast here because uh, we need to go, right? This decline of the velocity dispersion can be due to a plethora of phenomena. So we can go in the simulation and ask what keeps cold, dense, star-forming gas um, <coughs> hot against its will to cool down. And beyond the, the small scale interstellar medium uh, turbulence, we have cosmic gas inflows, outflows from supernova, from su feedback, galaxy mergers, and, and so and so forth. And so this is, I just wanted to give you a picture of what we can learn or not learn from our type of simulations. And we'll stop here.
So, um, one thing I didn't see in this very fast and amazing overview is um, when you compare the observations and the simulations, there are clearly biases in the observations about which galaxies you can observe based on the inclination. Oh, of yeah, the galaxies. Yeah, indeed. yeah, so what's the story of the inclination? So, modeling? here, indeed, I, I would think that the effects of inclination will come in within this factor of two or three. Here, I'm, 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 I'm showing you other possible systematics in these measurements. There will be the systematic of the inclination, which I didn't uh, verify here. But the other thing is that other, other, actually people don't even give me the measure of sigma. They give me a fitted sigma, assuming a certain model for how the kinematic, I mean, the rotation curves and the velocity dispersion should be. And so these are even adding uh, additional levels of uncertainty. Yeah, so you talked about the sigma, and uh, I, I was wondering maybe you can also say a few words about the velocity itself, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, especially that it was quite intriguing to find when uh, Genzel uh, published their papers, mm -hmm. paper about uh, high redshift galaxies with declining yes. rotation curves, and if you find something like this in the simulations, and what's so, the interpretation? Yes, and the answer is yes. So we see many, but then I think the point is that, okay, so we do a lot of rotation curves, as the one I showed you before, and, um, <clears throat> okay, some of them are declining. So if I do a John, then it depends very much on what he means that they decline, and whether we are talking about the given phase or whether the total material rotation curve. What I'm finding here is that I certainly see rotation curves that can be fine, but they don't, they are not necessarily their matter free. So it depends very much on the shape of the potential, of the underlying potential. Then we are actually working with them to see whether the way of inferring, say, that the matter fraction uh, is consistent with that simulation when we apply the method. Uh, but uh, whatever, so what I'm saying is that these, Results from observations are not straight from observations. There are lots of inferences and assumption and modeling to come out with, uh, say, the matter fraction associated to the defined rotation curves. But we, we do um, we do have different. Um, so, so, for example, if you if you would go further with the rotation curve that that seemed to decline, and in observation they didn't have enough uh, mm -hmm. sensitivity to go further. Yes. But maybe if they had the rotation curve. Would I don't know. I didn't check. That's right. I, I just checked that I, I went to the maximum here uh, to get my maximum of the rotation curve. Yeah, I don't know. I need to check. Okay. Well, thank Annalisa and Erica again. <laughs> and, and we're going to head over to Coho for the, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, for the copy break half. I'm going to make one quick announcement about collaboration day tomorrow.